Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Newfoundland Hobbyist. I really appreciate you being here. Today I want to talk about a hobby that kind of started a lot of my other hobbies and a really fun one that I think you can all participate in with very little initial effort. You don't need a lot of tooling and it's a whole lot of fun. I think you'll find a lot of joy in it. And that is the hobby of axe restoration. And there's so many other little hobbies entailed in that. Woodworking, sharpening and different things will go through it. But I have a beautiful little axe here today that I want to look at. We're going to fully restore it and you'll see what it is now. And you'll get to see what it can become. There are so many great axe manufacturers in the world and a lot of them have disappeared. Of course, during the Industrial Revolution, when there was a lot of woodworking going on, a lot of timber harvested and forests were just taken by storm, of course, axes were heavily relied on. In, uh, throughout the United States and some of the big timber, you go online and start Googling some of the images from the trees that they would take down with an ax and a crosscut saw. Just absolutely incredible. But here's an example of a beautiful, beautiful ax still made today. That is by a company in Sweden, Gransfors Brooks. Gransfors Brook, or that's what we would call it here uh, if you were Swedish. I think you would pronounce it quite a bit different than that, but. That's kind of the harsh way. But this is a beautiful, this is a small forest axe. Beautiful, I believe a 21 inch handle. My preferred size for an axe for most purposes. This is just beautiful, beautiful axe. Um, Wetterlings, a company that has, they announced their closure several years ago, but a long, long time axe manufacturer again in, uh, in Sweden. Now like a lot of products this day and age, Quality has gone down big time and for a lot of an axe manufacturers um, A lot of the axes you see now in your local hardware stores and things like that Quality is very low cheap real cheap low carbon content steel that just can't hold an edge just garbage poor Poor or no sheath poor quality handle materials just bad selection far from premium hickory uh, just a lot of problems you, of course, you can, companies like Grand's Forest Brook and Council Tools and things like that are making real high quality axes, but you're talking up $200, $300 for an axe. And uh, although that's lovely, a lot of the fun I have found over the years is in building your own axe. And in building your own axe, you can potentially get a premium tool, premium grade, for a very low cost. This is an Elwell axe head, and axes are usually measured in weight, not dimensions. So this is a, you can see there, one and a quarter. So this is a one and a quarter pound axe head. So just like you would have a four pound maul or an eight pound maul, axes are measured the same way. And there are all types of different patterns. It's a whole culture just built into axes alone. You can have so much fun learning about it, learning about the history. Again, with the, with the Industrial Revolution brought so many different companies and they all have a rich history throughout Europe and the United States and Canada. Our very own Canada produced some, some beautiful axes as well. Up in the Welland area in Ontario, the Welland Vale axe line, premium and pretty rare. If you can find one, if you can find one around, but this one was probably made, by my estimates, late 1800s. Elwell from England. You can still see made in England. Sometimes the stamps are largely, uh, have been worn out or carved out or sharpened out. But you can see lots of steel. This little head still has a beautiful taper for a pound and a quarter. I haven't weighed it, but I guess that it still weighs pretty much a pound and a quarter. And we are going to turn this into a premium axe today. My first step is to wire wheel. After I drill out any old handle that's been epoxied or, or hammered in there, usually they have screws in there keeping them tight and everything. But then I wire wheel and get off as much dirt as possible. Lovely. Now you can see that stamping in there. I've taken off most of that scaling. Just a beautiful head. You can see here some scarring where it looks like 
someone tried to clean this up with a flat wheel at some point so you can see not so much on this point on this side over here maybe a few marks but not bad this side a little more so you can choose now how much you want to do I've taken entire axe heads taken the whole surface off hand sanded them and polished them which is an extreme amount of work but a fun project rewarding when it's done you have something truly custom and special for this one I love the character marking on it I love these markings where the axe head was was pounded on at some point and this little bit of flaring here is pretty minimal nothing breaking or flaking away I'll leave that there now it's time to select a proper handle to our axe and there's a lot of things to touch on when selecting the proper handle as well King Canada has been bringing quality machinery tools and equipment to the North American market for over 38 years they offer innovative products for all applications, for the industrial and commercial setting, as well as the homeowner and hobbyist. King Canada is a sponsor of the Newfoundland Hobbyist. Handles alone have a whole set of uh, different terms, nomenclature, when it comes to your saw cut, your kerf here, uh, when it comes to the shoulder of the axe, when it comes to, some people call this your Fon's foot down here, the swell. Does it taper in one dimension or two? And axe guys really get hung up in a lot of these details in what makes the perfect axe. When you're in the hardware store selecting a handle for your axe, let's have a look at this grain. And this is very, very important not to be overlooked. This is almost a perfect scenario of grain orientation. It runs, you see, this is the way that our axe is oriented. That grain runs straight down through in this dimension, like this. Now, it makes sense that when an axe strikes, most of the tension throughout the handle is applied on this underside of the axe right here. The axe wants to go down this way, right? With our grain oriented in this dimension, the axe is very strong in that dimension. With these long stretches of grain running down through the handle here, right from tip to tail, you have the same piece of wood attached up here as is attached to your hand here. That wood is supported all the way along on each end like a brick. Now this old handle is almost a worst case scenario. I cut this off of a customer's axe a while ago when I, when I replaced it for a proper handle. This is almost worst case scenario. And you'll see this a lot in hardware store handles. So if you're picking out an axe and there's 20 on the shelf, look for the right one. Notice the way the grain is running in this handle. It's running across this way. And now think of our example. When an axe strikes, the pressure is driven downwards. This is downward force throughout the handle. Your, your hand is driving in you have this force driving up, this opposite reaction here from the wood. So all your pressure is on the underside. Now when your grain runs this way, this is the underbelly of the axe here. This is the underside of the handle. Notice there is what's called grain run out. And that means this little bit of wood that's attached right here to our axe head only runs to right here. It only runs to right here and here and here and you can see where it runs out all the way back. And so when you strike and you have all that downward pressure throughout here, this is a lot more likely to delaminate. And most axes you see where the handles break have grain orientation like this and they break through the grain. So they smash out through and you have a spear attached to your axe head and a spear in your hand because they separate from each other. The only grain in this handle that runs the entire length connects your hand to the axe is right here, right throughout this, this straight middle strip. This little bit, maybe an inch here. All the rest runs out here. This is separate back here, runs out. This palm swell runs out. And all this up here runs out as well. So this is almost worst case scenario. This axe is likely to fail with much use. And so for this head here, I've had this little handle sitting here for years. It's almost perfect in size. It's a perfect, uh, we won't need to do a whole lot with, with, the, uh, with getting it through the eye here at all. But pretty nice, little bit coarser grain 
than I would like. Now I understand for an axe this small, you're not taking no massive swings. It's not taking a terrible amount of abuse anyways, so you can kind of get away with a little more run out. It's not as serious an issue, but, uh, but this one still has no run out front to back just on the sides, just how you would want it. First step in fitting an axe handle, have a look at the end like this. Take your axe, place over the eye, where does material have to be removed? Do you need to remove any at all? Not often are they a straight through fit. Now I can see front to back, or this dimension, I don't need to take off any material. We're almost perfect, almost perfect in there. But I do have quite a bit too much bulk here. Work in small increments. I don't have to remove a lot of material, otherwise I'd use a draw knife or a spoke shave. In this case, I have some good files. Vintage, quality wood files here. For a long time, I used what's called a, a four-in-hand file. Some people call it four-in-one. These are woodworking files, great for something like this. You have uh, a flat coarse, a convex coarse, and you a little more fine, flat, and convex. And these chew off material pretty good. You'll just want to start carving away, and you can carve away that shoulder pretty quick. So be careful. As you start getting closer to finish, you can switch to the finer so you don't end up with too deep of striations in there. From brutal offshore drilling platforms, all the way to the homeowner and hobbyist, Lincoln Electric's 125 years of experience provides the quality you need to get the job done right. The Newfoundland Hobbyist is sponsored by Lincoln Electric. And while it doesn't really matter how this surface here looks, this shoulder, it's gonna be hard to clean up after. So you wanna get that as fine as you can with a file and bring it in with some sandpaper now. Make it nice and pretty. Okay, here we go, the mounting process. Little bit, I like boiled linseed oil. Classic, heavily used in ax production. Boiled linseed oil, but be careful with your towels. Don't throw them in the garbage bin. You wanna burn them or do something special with them because boiled, boiled linseed oil has an activator that generates heat to help it cure and dry. And if you throw them down in your garbage bin, you could have a serious fire on your hands. So what I've done is just oiled the neck down over the shoulders of the, the ax here. I'll push it as far as I can do. Now I'm gonna grab my cherry mallet and this might seem odd if you've never seen an ax properly mounted. You might think you'd have to hit the head. That's not the case. That's not the most effective way to do this. The most effective way is to hit the bottom of the handle. Just let it slide slightly. Don't hold it. You want to let inertia, inertia wants to keep the ax head right here in space. Inertia wants to stop the head. So by driving this, forcing the handle, the ax wants to stay there you're driving it through. And you can already see with those two cracks on the bottom, we're already almost flush with the top of the head. And we're protruding. We're watching the shoulders. Watch what it's doing down around the bottom of the head. Is it seating all the way? Seating beautifully. Real nice, starting to curl out wood on the handle there now. Lots proud just how we want it. Let's have an inspection here. That is almost poster perfect fit up. It's down, it's so tight that we have a slight curling all the way around, no gaps. Look at that, that little bit of curling, that little bit of peel, right down to the shoulders. That's the right amount exposed on the top. That is pretty much a perfect, not to toot my own horn at all, I've, just, I've done a lot of these. They don't always turn out this well, but that is what exactly, that's book textbook, what you should have end up with right here. A 
a little oil for our wedge as well. You know, I used to glue these in until I realized, one, that they, they don't slip back out, but two, if you don't glue them in, then you can potentially pull them out at a later date and refit your handles. Sometimes your handles shrink up a little bit. They dry up with different changes in humidity. And if that was to happen, you could pull out your wedge, carve your shoulders down a little bit further, and re-wedge, slightly bigger wedge. Done deal. Now I usually like to use uh, a small hatchet for this because of the flat surface and the rigidity. I don't know where my favorite axe for it is, so I'm just gonna use my wooden mallet here. Watch what's happening, don't split your handle out. Yeah, nice. And you can see at the top of the handle here is actually flared out because we have that amount. And here's where it pays off using that bit of uh, beautiful black walnut. Is look at that little bit of flavor in the top of the head here. Just gorgeous, the color we have there now. A lot of these handles usually aren't finished very fine from factory. Sometimes they're coated with varnish. They don't have quite the shape you want. Now's the time to refine that, hand sand it in, get the right shape, a nice smooth finish. You don't want all this coarse texture. Now's the type to, to, time to put the finishing touches on your handle. Now every axe needs a sheath. And I'm gonna show you guys how to design a beautiful little sheath. If you can come up with some leather and a few basic supplies, this is a great early on project to your leather making career. Let's get to work here. I'll show you first how to make a template. Now if your axe has a substantial, what's called a beard, which is a big underhang right here, let's say your axe comes out like this, then you can make a one part sheath without any kind of a strap. Now an axe like this that is pretty much straight profiled, you don't have that option. You're gonna want some type of strap that goes around the shoulder of the handle here. So what I'll do, is I'll trace the shape of my head like this and we'll give probably a half inch or a little more top and bottom. Now you're gonna wanna go a little bit more straight here like this because if you neck in like this, for example, when you try to pull out, you see that? You won't have enough room. So you wanna come a little bit more of a straight profile. That's just handy about like that. I'm thinking maybe a starting here, actually. Maybe we'll do a cool little turn, something like this. That'll look good. That'll look good on the ax. Keep it straight here and we'll go with something like that. Something like that. So now, we can go to the other side and get an idea what our sheath will look like on the ax. I think that's lovely. What we can do, I'm tracing that back on a sheet of paper, and I'm gonna cut that out right up, because now we have that top line but we're just gonna cut up to it, and I'll show you what I mean in just a second here. You see, I've cut up to that line. Now I can use that as my fold line. We can fold the sheath over like a taco. Make sure you fold right on that line so everything's symmetrical. Now we can trace it onto this side. Now by tracing that way and folding it over, we have lots of hang on the bottom and you need that because this is not gonna sit down tight. The thickness of the leather, the stiffness of the leather is gonna sit up off of there. So that gives you about the right amount of room for a closed in sheath, just like that. Now the original piece that we drew out, you want to cut the ax out of there and that will give you your welt. So now we'll trace off these couple pieces on some premium leather. And we will be well on our way. 
Century Welding is an online Canadian outlet for premier welding and cutting machines, equipment, and related accessories and replacement parts. Shop for your welding machines and accessories, consumables, and even your safety apparel. The Newfoundland Hobbyist is sponsored by Century Welding. So now we've glued up this lovely little pocket. We can trim up these edges and fair them up and then get to adding some rivets to the sheath. I think we'll do just a, a rivet construction, no stitching. But for now, I'm going to clean up these edges. You can trim these off with a knife and sand them in. You can use a couple different ways. I'm just going to run them over the belt sander. That's my preferred method at this point in time. Now the final step, now that we have an edge cover to protect it, our sheath, is to sharpen. So I've got a 120 grit belt here. I'm going to sharpen this just as I would sharpen my knives. Isn't that a pretty edge? You see, I just went with a slightly steeper bevel right up here near the edge, and then I polished some of the old steel that I uh, cleaned up years ago when I first got this axe. But very nice looking edge there. Now you could spend a lot more time and taper that in if you wanted. But I'd say this will suffice. What do you think? that razor edge. Let's get our leather edge protector on there. 
get it snapped in place and look at that package for one how rewarding is that you have this beautiful story this little axe head that I didn't I think I got it maybe for five or ten bucks from from an old guy in uh, CBS back in the day uh, back when I lived in the St. John's area but the beautiful history of this head what a beautiful mental piece this would be just to do like this you could even take some time if you want and airbrush the handle, airbrush, airbrush the sheath, make it look even more special. You could do some engravings. I've seen all sorts of stuff. What a fun hobby just to have fun building these and putting them on the mantle or collecting them. That said, this is as effective as a tool as the day it was made back in the late 1800s. Just as effective, maybe more so with that edge. Maybe it didn't have quite as good a handle. Surely it didn't have as good a sheath as this with this premium leather and stuff probably didn't ship with a sheath but this is a beautiful tool that you could put in your bike or, or in your hunting vehicle whatever what a great gift as well pop grandfather granddad whatever term you use in your area you could uh, put one of these together for your your little grandson or, uh, or something of that nature. You know, what a, what a great gift. Or I've known people to give these out to their, to their groomsmen. Grooms to give these out to their groomsmen. But what a great hobby. I really hope you've enjoyed following along, getting a little taste of it here. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you for watching. I want to give a big shout out to my sponsors who helped make this show possible. And as always, make sure you tune in next week to the Newfoundland Hobbyists.